David Smith here with another Flip Classroom Math video. A few tips before we get started. Remember you can always pause the video if you need to catch up with your notes. You can also speed up or slow down the playback if that helps. Finally, you can turn on the captions so you can see my words going by at the bottom of your screen. Today's lesson, today's lesson, measures of dispersion. So far in our statistics unit, we've been covering measures of central tendency. And these are things like mean, median, and mode. So we're measuring what the average is, kind of the central tendency, how the data might cluster around a certain value. Measures of dispersion measure how far the data is spread out, which is another characteristic of any data set. So dispersion is how spread out the data is, and then we use standard deviation, and that's essentially that's what this lesson is going to be about. Standard deviation measures dispersion. The higher the number, the more spread out the data is. It's calculated from a data set. So in this lesson, we're gonna look at a couple data sets that we've already looked at and calculate our standard deviation for that data. Finally, we use the sigma x. This is a lowercase sigma. Um, that's the symbol for standard deviation. And then finally, you can find it using your graphing display calculator. Now you can do this calculation by hand. In fact, our textbook will walk you through that if you wish. However, it's kind of a long, laborious calculation and your calculator will just do that. In fact, if you've already mastered the steps for finding mean, median, and mode on your calculator, this is just another result from those same steps. So nothing new to learn. I won't be posting new links in the video below. Okay, so let's get started. All right, let's do an example. Here we've got the number of ice creams sold over a 13-week period. So week one, we sold 146 ice creams, week two, 151, and so on. So these are our 13 data points for this data set. So now what I want you to do is go ahead and put these in your graphing display calculator and find the mean, median, and mode, and then notice that one of the results on your calculator is the sigma x, or the standard deviation. So go ahead and put that there as well. So pause the video, do that calculation. All right, here's what I get. My mean, 171.3, that's the average. My median and my mode are the same, 158. And then my standard deviation is 30.8. Now let's talk about these numbers together. First off, the average is quite a bit higher than the median and the mean. So that's going to tell us something about our data. Maybe there's outliers, maybe there's values that are in the high end, or a bunch of them, and check it out. I think that's true. We've got these ones that are fairly big. The rest of them kind of group in a zone between, say, 145 and 158, or 160. And then we've got these three quite a bit higher values. So that explains why the difference between the mean and the median and the mode. And now check this out. Our standard deviation is 30.8. That's a pretty big number for standard deviation. So that tells us that the data is spread out. It's not tightly clustered. And you can see that's true here. Our lowest value is 146 and our highest value is 238. So that's quite a big spread for data. Let's do an example with dice. So in this situation, we have two dice, we toss them a hundred times, and we add up the results. So here's our table. The score is the result. So what this means is that we, we got a total of two 21 times. We got a total of three nine times. We got a total of four eight times, and so on across this table. And we're going to analyze this data and take a look and see what it tells us about that situation. So before I cut you loose, I want you to take a look at that table. There's a few things in there that seem a little weird to me, and perhaps you'll catch those before we do our calculation. Okay, now I'm not going to answer that question right away. Let's do the calc first, and then we'll talk about the data set. So what I want you to do now is enter this data into your graphing display calculator and find the mean, the median, the mode, and the standard deviation. Okay, here's what I get. My mean, my average is 5.82. My median is seven. That's the value for which half the data is less than and half the data is more. 
My mode is two because we rolled two 21 times in this trial. And then finally, my standard deviation is 2.8. So first, let's talk about standard deviation. The standard deviation in this one is much, much lower. So what that means is the data is not so spread out. It's more tightly clustered around the mean. So that's how we use standard deviation. The spread outness is how far away from the mean the data can be, okay? So this one has got much less, a much lower standard deviation. So we know this data set isn't quite so spread out. Now let's take a look at a, a few other interesting things. First off, the average 5.82 is a little ways away from our mean. And then check this out, our mode is two. Our mode is as far from the mean as we get. We had a two rolled 21 times. That's rolling two ones on two dice. So this data set is a little weird. The standard deviation tells us it's pretty tightly clustered, but then our mode suggests that for some reason there's, it's just, it's just a kind of a weird data set. If I looked at this, I might believe that these dice were loaded in some way to come up with the ones on them because we got, we rolled two ones 21 times. Now you can figure out the odds of that. It's quite hard to do. Rolling two ones is 36, or it's one out of 36 times. And we rolled that quite a bit. We rolled that for over 20% of our trial. So not terribly likely. Does it mean it's for sure? A loaded dice? No, it does not. This is entirely possible. In a probability question, you might be asked to calculate what is the likelihood of getting 21 twos in 100 rolls of two dice. So an interesting data set here. All right, let's look at one more example. And guess what? The cats are back. Okay, so check this data set out. We weighed 50 cats and we're using weight classes. And remember, when the data is continuous, you have to use classes, or that's one way to organize your data, use a class of weights. So each of these lines represents one weight class. And what we have here is this is the class of weights that's greater than or equal to two kilograms, but less than three. So roughly, this is two to three kilograms. We have five cats in that weight class. Three to four kilograms, 19, four to five, 17, and so on down our table. Now, I want you to take a look at that data and see if you can come up with some thoughts about the data using like these ideas that we've had here. Okay, so now what I want you to do is go ahead and put this data in your calculator and find these four values. But remember, there's one trick you need to do first. Pause the video, think about that, or flip back through your notes and see if you can figure out what that trick is. So the trick is, since this is a weight class, we know we have five students, or students, five cats in between two and three kilograms, but we don't know what their actual weights are. So what we do is we just pick a midpoint between the two end members of our weight class. And so between two and three, we pick 2.5 as our midpoint. Now this has an effect on our calculations. They're only approximate because we don't know. We could have five cats that are all 2.1, 2.2, 2.1, 2.25. It could be on the low end of this weight class, in which case using a 2.5 midpoint would overestimate the weight for this class. So remember that when you do pick a midpoint, you're adding a little bit of a level of uncertainty or approximation to your data set. So now, when you go into your graphing display calculator, you can use a frequency table and you use this as your data point. So we have five weights at 2.5, 19 weights at 3.5, 17 at 4.5, and so on, okay? So now, pause the video, get out your graphing display calculator and find these four values. Okay, let's see how you did. For me, I get my average, my mean is 4.2 kilograms. My median, that's the middle value, the value for which um, half the data is less than and half the data is more than, is going to be 4.5 kilograms. That's my median, which is this weight class. And then finally, or not finally, but my mode is going to be a weight class. 
So this is the class with the most values in it, and that would be the three to four because indeed we have 19 cats that fell into this class. So when you do have continuous data and you've divided it up in classes with midpoints, then you don't have a mode, you have a modal class, but it's the same idea. Finally, my standard deviation is 1.1 kilograms. That's the lowest one we've done so far. So now, what I want you to do is think for a minute about what all this information here tells you about this data. See if you can come to some conclusions based on what we did in the last two examples. Okay, so first one, big obvious takeaway is this. Standard deviation is really low. That means this data is tightly clustered around the mean. And guess what? It really does look like that. I mean, we have quite a bit of our data here. This is what, 36 data points out of 50 are right in here. And indeed, that's between the uh, 3.5 kilogram weight class and the 4.5 kilogram weight class. So, and that satisfies also our, our average, our mean. Our mean is 4.2 kilograms and our median is 4.5 kilograms. So all of these measures support the concept that this data is tightly clustered the mean, median, and mode all line up very closely. So in a way, you could use any one of these, um, these measures to describe this data faithfully. And then with the standard deviation, that just reinforces that. Now, it's arguable that you could comment, you could make these comments without these numbers just by looking at this data set. And it's true. Just look there. You can see that most of the data is like right here. So I'm going to guess just by looking at the data, I can make a pretty good guess as to what my mean, my median, and my mode are. And then I could make a pretty good guess that the standard deviation of this data is pretty low because it's tightly clustered, not spread out. However, what if you're a scientist and you're doing an experiment and you have a thousand data points? If I show you that in a big old table, it might be really hard to draw a conclusion based on that table. So that's where these calculations will come into play. And in a journal, a scientist will do two things. They'll publish their data. The actual data should be in that article. And then they'll show their calculations. And that way, another scientist can perform other calculations on that same data and things like that. So the examples you get here are relatively simple in that we don't have a ton of data, but the technique works for large data sets. And in that case, you really do need these numbers to say smart things about the data that you're looking at. Now that you've watched the video, take a moment and write down any questions that you might have so you can bring them to our next class. Remember that you can always watch the video again and perfect your notes. Finally, if you enjoyed the video, please click the like button down below. And if you'd like to help me grow my YouTube channel, please click subscribe.